Grace and peace. Welcome to Real Devotions by the CCC staff. 2020 has been a pretty rough year for, I would guess, all of us. And some of us might have experienced some properly traumatic things this year. So I think this morning it's worth looking to scripture for wisdom as to how we can process such suffering. And one of the best places that we can do that is in the book of Lamentations. So let's turn to Lamentations chapter 3. We'll be reading verse 14 to 24. 13 to 24. Lamentations 3, 13 and 24. Thus says the Lord, He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become a laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. Remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continuously remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. This is the word of God. Now, some context on the book of Lamentations. It is written by a survivor of the siege of Jerusalem, reflecting on the terrible thing that happened at that period. And this was an unspeakable tragedy. This was the most horrific thing that has ever happened to Israel. Everything they have worked for and built has been destroyed. God's presence has left the temple and the land that God has promised them has been taken away. And they suffered very harshly uh, under the hands of the Babylonians. If you want to read exactly how it is, read chapter 1 and 2 in Lamentations and even in the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It's truly a terrible time. And so the book of Lamentations is this poem where we see the author voice his pain towards God, and we see him openly process his suffering to God. And this is what was going on in the passage that we just read. So let's go through this uh, verse by verse pretty quickly and draw some wisdom out of it. So he opens in verse 13 to 18, right? By describing his suffering and the state of his soul. In verse 13, he compares his pain as if he's been shot in the kidneys by an arrow, right? And in verse 14, it shows that he feels humiliation. He's become a laughingstock and the people around him are taunting him. He's also very bitter, right? Filled with bitterness, he says. And he's drenched in this thing called wormwood. Wormwood is this poisonous, bitter herb that exists and was used medicinally back then. And in verse 16, we see that the author feels uh, trampled on. His teeth are on the ground. He feels beaten up and crouched. Uh, and, and he has to cower now. Right? He feels afraid. His confidence and self-esteem is now completely gone. Verse 17 says, goes further, there's no peace in his soul. That he's even for, forgotten what happiness even is. And in verse 18, we see him express the fact that he's in a state where he really can't take it anymore. And his hope in the Lord is even gone. His endurance is gone and, and his hope is gone. So we see this uh, person is in a really dark place, right? He's hurting, he's humiliated, bitter, depressed, hopeless, basically all of the negative emotions, all the worst emotions that you can imagine. And maybe some of us kind of knows have felt something like this before. And maybe we can relate to this um, even now. And if we read the Book of Lamentations in its entirety, it's clear that the author knows that the one who did this is the Lord, the He who is being referred to in these verses is God. Right? And remember the context of why Israel was attacked and besieged by Babylon in the first place. Right? It was because they ignored God's word and repeatedly disobeyed Him. So perhaps counterintuitively for most of us, the author does not shake his fist in anger to the Lord. He does not resent Him. And he does not accuse the Lord of being unrighteous as perhaps many of our hearts would be tempted to do if we were in his position. And 
we might feel like, well, we're not like Israel. We haven't done anything that bad, have we? And so do we deserve to suffer as harshly as we have? And far be it from me and anyone besides God to say that what we did directly caused the suffering that we've experienced lately or in our lives in general. But this does not change the fact that the Bible teaches pretty clearly in a lot of places that God does allow suffering to happen. And the reason why suffering exists in creation is because the sinfulness of humans, both the sins that we personally commit or that we commit collectively as a species. We are all guilty. And so the suffering that happens to us is not really unjust in, in the Bible's eyes. Suffering is simply a reality of living in a cursed sinful world amongst sinful people whose heart has been corrupted by sin. And so how does the author respond to this reality of suffering, sometimes intense suffering, that could happen to us as we still live on this earth? We see in verse 19 to 21, right, his response to suffering. In verse 19 to 20, the author invites us to remember what he's been through. He himself is traumatized by it. He says his soul remembers it and is weighed down. In verse 21, though, it's a turning point. Even in this state, he is still able to find hope. And how does he find hope? We see in verse 22 24, he finds hope in the character of God. Now, these verses, Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 24, is the most hopeful. Uh, part of the entire book of Lamentations. And the grounds, the center of why he has this hope is this word that's used there, the steadfast love of God. In Hebrew, right, this word is chesed. And this word specifically refers to God's covenant faithfulness, a, a part of God's character wherein he will do what he has promised in his covenant. And so the verse, if we translate it in the Hebrew more literally, says that because of God's covenant faithfulness, we never perish. You see, the source of the hope of the author comes from the fact that God has made a covenant promise to his people. And because God is faithful to his covenant, he knows that his mercies are new every morning, that this judgment will not last forever. There's always Mercy. So what's interesting here is that the author understands that although God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he will not allow sin to go unpunished. So because Israel and the author has seen God's faithfulness in bringing down justice for, for sin, for the author, this does not mean that therefore God has nullified his promise to save them, but rather it shows him that God too will be faithful to fulfill his promise to be gracious and merciful, to be their God, to always forgive and give grace. And so because of this, the author knows that the Lord is his portion, that the Lord is his ultimate source of comfort, that no matter what, he has the Lord. Therefore, he always has hope. Now, this is a really difficult truth to internalize, admittedly. Because from a human perspective, right, hope is always based on something physical or material that is available to us, right? Uh, things that we're able to do, the resources we have access to, um, the, the relationships that we have, the people who we know, right? And we usually only think that things could get better to the degree to which we can leverage the things that are available to us to improve our situations, right? Because that's what hope is, or an expectation of something better in the future. And I think if anything, this crisis really sh drives home the reality that it is very much possible that the material things that we have can be pretty instantly taken away from us. Just like what happened to Israel in the time of Lamentations. So if our hope is not in the Lord, there are really only two things that can happen to us that we can do in the situation. Either we try to convince ourselves that things are not as bad as it seems, and we try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we try to work harder, as hard as we can, until things get better. Till of course, 
we find a situation that simply is too hard for us and we have to accept our limitations which means we're gonna go to option two which is being resigned to our fate right just simply trying to accept that we'll never truly be happy or as happy ever again and and then from there we just try to make the best of whatever is left but if the Lord is our hope and faithfulness we have a hope that can never be taken away we always have strength to go on because the best is yet to come you see Jesus guaranteed on the cross that even if we die right the worst possible thing that could happen to us really we will enter into the most glorious state into glory face-to-face -face fellowship with God and by his Holy Spirit while we live on this earth that's cursed and full of suffering we are not alone but we are guided by our Heavenly Father by the steadfast covenant love of our Heavenly Father that covers us this is our sure and steady anchor and so while we get to live we get to witness God's faithfulness the mercies that we get that we can get every morning and find that no matter how bad how dire the storm rages deeper still holds our anger now friends let's ask ourselves in this very volatile time what anchors our soul what keeps it from slipping into despair the bible says only the lord can do that